My name is Kim Kopko and I am a Senior Extension Associate in the Department of Policy Analysis and Management in the College of Human Ecology. I work um, on the Parenting in Context project with Professor Rachel Dunifin and on that project we um, serve as the university level support for all the parent educators who are in the Cornell Cooperative Extension System across the state. We do um, a lot of work on this project. We collect um, evaluation data on parenting programs so we can say how are we doing on parenting across the state. Um, we, do, um, we organize quite a few professional development opportunities in services on campus um, in coordination with some of the lectures and events that are occurring on campus. We um, write translational research pieces, so research briefs for the educators to use in their own work and um, resources that they can also hand out to the parents who come into their programs. And we, um, we produce reports on the data that we collect that we send out to the counties and um, also a statewide report that our educators can use to take, kind of take back to their funders and say here's how we're doing, here's the results and the outcomes that we're um, achieving. So that's um, one side of my work. The other side is also working with Professor Rachel Dunifin on um, research where we collect um, data on grandparents who are raising their teenage grandchildren. So these are families where your know, grandmother or grandfather has not moved into the house to help out parents necessarily, but they are the head of the household. So um, it's grandparent and head of households, <coughs> excuse me, they are an increasing family type in the US. Um, so there's some interesting family processes that we're looking at with those types of families. And we chose teens partly because um, just from a developmental perspective, adolescence is a really interesting time. Um, even if you're just being raised by your parents. And so for grandparents, they have some unique issues like being one generation removed from when they raised their own parent, uh, their own children, excuse me. And um, we also heard from a number of our educators that this was, this was a real need out in the communities in New York. So we responded to that need by um, doing some research on the topic. And then finally, I work on a project with Professor John Eckenrode out of the Brenner Center for translational research and that's a project called PROSPER and it's not a program but it's a delivery model that we're actually very interested in in extension overall because what it allows us to do is it's it's this um, model that connects extension with the public school system in, um, high, in resulting in higher recruitment rates for families we're actually just able to reach more youth and families through this connection and we, um, we use this model to deliver evidence-based programs to reduce uh, risk-taking behaviors. It's aimed at 6th um, and 7th grade middle school youth and their families. And so it's designed to, for universal prevention, kind of catch some risky behaviors before they develop. Um, and, but it's, it's much more on the positive development side. So it strengthens families, strengthens communication, um, helps parents know how to deal with um, teens uh, as they're emerging teens and it also really helps to connect, connect uh, make the connections between extension and the public school systems. Mm -hmm. So that's what I spend my days doing. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. So how long have you been with extension? I've or been with, in an extension role I guess? Yeah, um, so I did my graduate work here at Cornell in human development. Mm -hmm. um, I graduated in 2005 and um, I came back full-time working in Extension in 2007. So I was teaching at Ithaca College for that year and then um, so I've been here since 2007. Full so what brought, you, what brought you back to Extension? Well, um, when I was in human development, it's actually a very interesting question. When I was doing my graduate work in human development, I was interested in the parenting and child side of things and um, the work that I was doing then was really much more applied um, and so I knew then that I was interested in that kind of work and uh, my advisors, my committee worked um, really well with me to help me um, kind of meet those goals and, and my interests but it was clear to me that the applied side at that point um, was very much more on the extension side of things, kind of reaching out to families and youth and, and seeing what was going on in, in, the, in the family system and 
so when um, I knew that Rachel was doing some work um, and she was in a different department when I was a graduate student so I kept kind of on top of that work but couldn't be fully involved in it because I was I was doing my graduate work and so I did keep in touch with what was going on with that as while I was at Ithaca College and um, as Rachel and I kept in touch I came to learn that there was an opening and um, I didn't have to think twice about coming back and, and doing that work and it really has evolved what I was what I was brought back to do was was um, kind of in a more limited realm and we've just grown the project and grown our research and um, grown our program work team so it's, it's been great. Now there's a lot of talk around translational research. In a nutshell, if I were just walking down the street and asked you to explain that to me, how would you explain translational research? Okay, so my caveat is um, if if you asked five different people, you might get five different answers. Um, there is a formal definition to translational research. It really has its its history in <clears throat> excuse me in a medical model side. So, sort of um, research to bedside. You know what we what we learn from basic research and how we kind of move that to helping people patients on the medical side. Of course, um, what. Translational research in the College of Human Ecology, I think, has a couple different uses. So on the Parenting in, in Context project, the way I use the term translational research is, um, say, parent educators uh, contact us and say, we really want to know about the state of um, parenting styles and adolescent development. We need to know kind of what the latest research is out there. Instead of us saying, well, here are the 10 latest studies, journal articles, read them, we do that, and then we'll boil it down into maybe five or six page research brief, where we say, here's the latest state of the research. It really sort of gets at the, at the kernel of what it is without presenting all of the statistics and all of the analyses. And so what I call translational research there is that I'm taking kind of the latest state of the research and putting it in a very readable format for the educators to use. Um, translational research can also mean just doing something that's a little different than basic research, so maybe more applied. So there are faculty members, for example, who are um, not on the extension side necessarily, but they have a real interest in working with youth and families. So they may, um, they may go out and collect their data from 4-H um, youth who are at a camp or from infants um, who are you know, connecting with our educators who have access to families who have newborns, for example. Mm -hmm. And so that's very different than bringing someone into your lab and collecting data in that way. Um, I would call that more applied, engaged um, type of research. And then, of course, the work that goes on in the Broffenbrenner Center for Translational Research kind of encompasses all of that. So it's um, you know writing research findings in a way that present them in a in a more digestible, friendly, user friendly format, and also you know working with youth and communities, which is kind of on the more translational as opposed to experimental side of research, where you're just doing your research in a lab setting, for example. So one of the things I I would like to be able to explain to people is. The process, and you talked about developing the PROSPER program, that's something that's sort of evolving and developing now. Right. So what is the process, how does a program like that get started? Does somebody come to you and say, hey, there's a problem, or does somebody, does somebody from campus go out and say, hey, I noticed a problem? What's the process? So that's a very good question. PROSPER was unique in a number of ways. So PROSPER was developed out of Iowa State and in collaboration with Penn State. So PROSPER is a national program. Mm -hmm. Many of the programs that I've talked with you about are what I would call homegrown programs. So they were either curriculum that was written based on research that was done here at Cornell. So we have a number of parenting programs that are written um, that way based on research. Uh, one for the grandparent caregivers is PASTA, Parenting a Second Time Around. So that was developed here by, by Cornell folks and um, has gotten national recognition. Then there's what are called evidence-based programs. So what I just described are research-based. They're very firmly rooted in research that has gone on here at Cornell and elsewhere. Evidence-based programs, there was a trend that started several years ago towards evidence-based programs. And that is, if we have a research-based program and we have someone, a grandparent, going through the PASTA program, for example, we give them a pretest at the very beginning and ask them various questions. 
the end of the seven, eight week program, we give them a post test that asks the exact same questions. And we're looking to see if there's a change as a result of participation in this program. And we do see some positive changes. What we can't say is because you participated in this program, that caused this change that we see. Um, there's always that magical you know, third variable. Um, maybe they found a support group. Maybe they're reading more books. Maybe they're laid off and they have a lot of time at home that they can be much more patient and flexible. You name it, um, it's a possibility. With evidence-based programs, they're very rigorously tested in this randomized controlled trial design. So you may have 14 sites where families and youth are actually getting the program, the treatment. This again is borrowed from the medical model. And 14 sites where it's the control group. They are not participating in the program. Randomized control trials are very expensive, they're very time intensive, but if you subject a program to a randomized control trial and you have these results, what you can say in the end is that program caused this. So there's been a movement to evidence-based programs from funders because they want to know that if they're funding something, a project, it is using a program that's known to work. And so there are pluses and minuses, as you can imagine. You pluck a program off the shelf and it has to meet your needs, as opposed to you being able to adapt it to meet your needs. There's, there's very little adaptability with evidence-based programs. So we started moving in that direction, recognizing that trend. What um, PROSPER does is delivers just evidence-based programs. So it came at a time when Extension Administration, many faculty were recognizing the need to um, want to incorporate more evidence-based programs into sort of our, our repertoire, our menu of programs. We were already doing that with a program called Strengthening Families Program from 2007 onward. And that happens to be one of the programs on the menu of PROSPER programs. So PROSPER comes to us, there was this pretty detailed process of how states got selected. Um, they um, contacted Helene Dillard, who thought this would be a good idea. They felt that New York could potentially be a PROSPER state. We um, received some funding for about two years to build capacity across the state. And that was, for lack of a better term, just increasing awareness, meeting with folks in Albany, um, at many of the state agencies, um, doing presentations across the state um, within our own system, and raising awareness for what PROSPER was. So think of it, um, I would actually need some visuals here, but <laughs> it's a model. It's, it's a delivery model that for a way of getting these programs out into communities. It's a little different than what we do in Extension because an Extension educator is just raring to hit the ground running with a program and implement that program. This kind of um, forced us to pull back a little bit. You form community teams, so you have a team leader who's extension, and you have a co-team leader who's someone from the school. And then they put together a team of eight to ten people in their community. Mostly other agency folks, um, it can be law enforcement, it can be judges, it can be um, um, business people with a philanthropic orientation, it can be religious leaders, anyone who's really interested in sort of shoring up um, positive youth development and strong families in their communities. So they form their, their teams, they work with their teams for about a year, the teams pick a family program off of a menu of programs, all evidence-based programs, strengthening families being one of them. They implement that in sixth grade, then the next year they implement another evidence-based program that's on the school side in seventh grade. And so it's very similar to what Extension is doing in the sense that they know how to implement evidence-based programs, but it strengthened the connection with the communities and it strengthened the connection with schools. Now some of our educators were doing this already, but it wasn't very formalized and not necessarily sustained either. So you may offer one program for eight weeks and then that goes away. Um, if the school wants to work with you again, great, but there's no sort of formalization or standardization of it. And so this, is, this has helped us in extension come up with a model for not only sustaining programs over time, but building these. It's, it's very much a community-based research model. And um, 
there's a lot more buy-in, there's a lot more coordination. It's opened us up to tapping other funding sources like public health funding sources that we couldn't tap before, mental health funding. And so it's really taken kind of the core and, and the essence of what we do in extension but advanced it to this, to this very different level. The shift in sources of funds has tremendously impact, impacted the work, not only the work, but how we present the work. Mm -hmm. And it's also narrowed the focus of the work. Mm, you're right on that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I mean, in my mind, it's unfortunate we are, we are just sort of narrowing down to what the source of funds are. But that's the way it happens. And, and you know, we end up working with corporate partners, and that mm -hmm. has incredible challenges and difficulties. And that's very different. That's a very different, the philosophy, the spirit can be very different with that. But I think you're right on another angle with the funding. It, it, um, it impacts the continuity of your work. So not only does it narrow it and it's become incredibly competitive, but if you, if you have a three-year grant to do this work and then an educator reaches out and says, can you help me with that? and it's not under your grant funded time, you either have to find the time or make the time. And yes, you can do that every once in a while, but you can't do it as a matter of course or practice. And then three years later, you can't write for another three years to say, I want to do the same thing I did three years ago. You have to shift the focus. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't allow you to have continuity in your work. Um, and again, as, as we've said, a lot of the work in extension is relationship building and maintaining and keeping those relationships and growing them and it's very difficult to do that if you're working in one particular pocket for three years and then another particular pocket for three years and so um, that's a challenge and I think another challenge is um, well, I wouldn't say a challenge, it, it's a shift and, and, and I know that um, the Dean of Human Ecology, Alan Matthews, has talked about this, but there's some shift in the major funding that really hasn't traditionally been a source of extension funding. So NIH, NSF, those types of very large grants for research are increasingly requiring, and this could get back to our basic versus applied research conversation, they're increasingly um, requiring some application of the research, some way to get the findings out to people who can use it, or policy, or whatever it is that has some meat, some use. And as a result of that, some of the faculty who are getting those larger grants are now needing to partner with Extension or folks in the field who have that expertise to say, I can help you get this on the ground, I can help you get this implemented. And so presumably their funding could be from faculty grants where that was not the model in the past yeah. and I think I think it's a, it's a new it's definitely um, nascent but I think it's the trend and it's a shift and I think it's a good shift because it furthers those connections um, in ways that we are not used to to having I appreciate the um, kind of the <clears throat> the sadness over the changes but I also think that there is quite a bit of positive that can come out of, of those necessary changes. I mean, extension isn't really the only system that's had to, that's undergone changes and that's had to change as a result of economic realities, um, you know, just contemporary realities. But I don't think we really are recognized, I, I would agree with that, for just how unique we are. We're the largest informal educational system um, in the country, if not the world, that other than the public schools. And the public schools are first, you know, up, up until the time you, you graduate from school, but we continue with that. And so there, there's that unique aspect that I don't hear highlighted a lot. We also are so grounded in research we're not just coming up with a program or telling you something you should do and um, you know we're not therapists we're not doing any of that type of work so we're very unique in that regard as an educational um, you know part of part of a larger research university that's an educational unit that what what we're turning out to communities is very solid it's mm -hmm. very solid work and it's not you know at a time when families are in crisis it's not you know, again, a clinical type of setting. 
And I, I don't know of anything else that's like that. And I, I don't hear that said an awful lot. And I think, again, um, the, the very unique relationship that extension offices have with their communities, that they can identify those needs and they can meet those needs. And again, we've had that with educators reach out to us and say, here's what's happening in our community. We've really noticed the shift over the last several years, whether it's um, um, more teens going into foster care, how can you help with this? Um, more teens using um, hard substances, um, reading programs for young children in one community, and it, they really are, they really have their hand on the heartbeat of their community. And even when Rachel and I were collecting data on grandparents, you can imagine a call to a grandparent from us, we're from Cornell, we want to collect you know, data on you. We utilize those networks, so we tapped in to there's a there's a program across New York State called RAP, the Relatives as Parents program, and it's this umbrella program for support groups for grandparents raising teenagers, for the PASTA program, and our educators in their communities have had these long relationships with the grandparent caregiver families. We contact the educator, they reach out to their families, we show up where they are, where they live, where they're familiar with the agency that they're familiar coming into and we have 20, 10, 20 ready-made families just waiting there for us. I, you know, I don't know it from the other side but I wonder if Rachel and I would have had that type of success had we tried to reach out to families. Now maybe by saying so-and-so gave us your name and asked us to contact you, but we're still using the link, the linchpin is still that educator and that tie to those families in their communities. So even doing research from the university level, we don't have that, you know, that strong connection that our educators have with families. Mm -hmm.